Morning, everybody. I'm very glad to welcome you to today's event. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Je suis très heureuse de vous accueillir à l'événement d'aujourd'hui. Le premier événement à être organisé par les six groupes piliers du groupe politique du Parlement européen, PPE, SND, Renew, le CR, les Verts et le groupe de la. Did we did we start already? Because now I see different persons dropping in. Sorry. This common event is a small but nonetheless important example of what we need now in Europe to recover from the pandemic. Common effort, mutual trust, and mentality. We in cult consider it now most important to find a new EU-wide approach to support the cultural and creative sectors and industries and focus on ways to reactivate Europe's cultural events and venues. We want to discuss with you today the state of play and the need of the sector. And most importantly, we will look at ways forward to help cultural professionals and organizations in the near future to recover and rebuild cultural creativity in Europe. Today, we want to invite you to discuss with experts from the cultural and creative industries and safe return to events and a, con uh, a coordinated EU-wide approach, which will hopefully help lift restrictions finally. This is essential for the survival of cultural and creative economies that have been particularly hardly affected by the COVID-19 restrictions. Quickly, some organizational remarks. For those following the meeting on Zoom, please note that we have interpretation, which I think until, uh, now, uh, until noon in English, French, Spanish and Bulgarian. However, should you want to listen to the meeting in Bulgarian, you need to select Portuguese. It's a bit strange, but uh, this is uh, uh, out of a technical solution. And the list is for a reason of limitation. Zoom does not know how to include Bulgarian in the languages and um, therefore uh, today Bulgarian is Portuguese. No, it is a real Bulgarian, but under the name of Portuguese. If you want to ask questions to our panelists, please write them in the chat on Zoom or on Livecast if you are following on Livecast. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speakers. We will start now by listening to a keynote by Mrs. Paola Leoncini Bartoli. She's Director for Cultural Policies and Development at the UNESCO. Her intervention will be followed by some introductory words by Mrs. Nejina Petrova, member of the cabinet of Commissioner Maria Gabriel, being responsible among other topics and cultural tourism in the cabinet of our commissioner. And then my fellow colleague, MEP Alexis Georgoulis from the left, and MEP Andrei Slabakov from ECR, they will say a few words too. I'm looking forward to hear your thoughts, experiences and ideas, and thank you all for joining us today. So now, Mrs. Paola Leoncini Bartoli, the floor is yours for seven minutes, please. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone, uh, excellencies, dear participants. Uh, on behalf of UNESCO, I would like to thank you for this very important opportunity provided to us to be with you and to warmly welcome uh, this initiative, which resonates with UNESCO's own efforts to leverage culture for socio-economic recovery and for driving transformative change to build back better, notably as we celebrate this year, the UN International Year of the Creative Economy. It has been more than one year since COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, acting both as a revelator and accelerator of existing vulnerabilities of the culture sector uh, worldwide. Europe itself has experienced an overall 31% fall in revenue in the culture sector. UNESCO reacted immediately to the crisis by adapting its work, providing short-term emergency assistance to its member states, but also anticipating long-term consequences and responses to the crisis. 
we have followed equally uh, EU's efforts for the integration of culture into the EU recovery and resilience facility. However, in the past 12 months, continuous disruptions have questioned the boundaries between rescue on one hand and recovery on the other. The measures initially designed to uh, face the immediate impact of the pandemic have begun to deeply transform patterns of cultural consumption, production, and work on the long term. Turning the page to the second, must decide what steps are needed to move towards a more resilient and sustainable sector. The crisis has shifted policymaking processes, but also priorities towards more transversal and collaborative patterns. This was made possible because the pandemic has also revealed the power of culture in bringing us together. We need to build on this momentum and join efforts for 2021 to be the first of many years of deliberate action and investment in the culture sector and to deliberately anchor culture as a common good in our core priorities across the policy spectrum in the, poly, in the spirit of the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. UNESCO considers that culture pervades all of the 17 SDGs. Since the beginning of the crisis, UNESCO has amplified its catalyzer function, driving the dialogue across a variety and diversity of stakeholders. In April 2020, we brought together over 130 ministers of culture for an online meeting to discuss the impact of the uh, health crisis on the culture sector. Uh, we also expanded collaboration with regional and sub-regional uh, IGOs and development banks to target specific demands and needs of different regions of the world in the culture sector. These dialogues sparked a massive mobilization testifying countries' commitment to international cooperation on culture for sustainable development. The growing recognition of the economic weight of culture and its key role for socio-economic recovery was further witnessed by the integration of culture in the G20 process as of last year under the presidency of Saudi Arabia. And this year, uh, culture is at the core of the G20 summit under the uh, presidency of Italy uh, of the G20. The meeting of ministers of culture that will be held in Rome on 29-30 July will lead to the adoption of a G20 ministerial declaration on culture, which we hope will be inspiring G20 leaders in the fall this year. Last year, UNESCO also launched Resiliart, a global movement to support creative professionals and artists uh, uh, across the globe, uh, which triggered more than 300 debates involving 110 countries. The first outcomes of Resiliart are co currently being consolidated uh, in order to shed some light and inform the International Year of the Creative Economy for Sustainable Development uh, this year. A high-level political forum at the UN in New York took place on 21st May, so only a few uh, days uh, uh, since uh, today, uh, and discussed these uh, recommendations stemming from the uh, creative sector. UNESCO also developed analytical surveys and online monitoring tool instruments that you can see on the screen uh, to monitor uh, and in the impact of the pandemic on the sector and the response of countries. Among these tools, the tracker on culture and public policy, an online monthly monitoring tool in the form of a bulletin, as well as the culture 2030 thematic indicators, which uh, we are rolling out thanks to the generous uh, support of the EU, uh, which uh, is uh, uh, strategically uh, bringing them forward together with UNESCO in a number of countries which are listed on the screen. 
All these activities strengthened UNESCO's global assessment on the impact of the pandemic, but also provided clear indications on regional trends and priorities. For example, in Africa and the SITs, small island developing countries, only 5% of museums have been able to develop online content, revealing the widening global digital divide threats to uh, linguistic diversity online. Testimonials from Latin America and the Caribbean highlighted the key role of local authorities to support the sector, while professionals from Europe and North America have called for joint actions to link culture and mental health and resilience. In Europe, climate action, the protection of cultural diversity in the digital environment, and the need of upskilling cultural professionals were identified as priorities. At the global level, expanding access to culture and accelerating digital literacy have been common denominators across all regions, even if policy measures have taken numerous forms. Most EU are able to quickly put in place government support mechanisms, some targeting national economies as a whole, others catered specifically for the cultural sector, triggering a broader reflection on public funding frameworks for culture and other forms of support, such as public-private partnerships and civil society engagement. The wide range of measures undertaken by countries illustrate the necessity for a comprehensive approach to public policy support across different domains, especially to address the following four priorities. One, supporting the adaptation of the cultural sector to the digital transformation. Two, strengthening the evidence based of the weight of the culture sector for countries, both in social and economic terms, which implies leveraging culture for job creation, especially for vulnerable groups, such as we, youth and women. Three, supporting the contribution of culture to climate adaptation and mitigation. And four, fostering closer synergies between culture and education, including through technical and vocational education, non-formal education and lifelong learning. In conclusion, this joint endeavor requires advocacy actions and international cooperation in order to shed new light on the role of culture as a common good towards shaping inclusive and more adaptive societies. Looking forward, these actions will pave the way towards the Mondia Cult, the World Conference on Cultural Policies for Sustainable Development which will be convened by UNESCO in Mexico in 2022. The leadership of the European Union is key and will be critical to amplify this global momentum on culture in public policy across the broad spectrum to achieve a more. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Paola Leoncini Bartoli, for this keynote. I think it's quite inspiring, and we should uh, uh, also take into account how engaged UNESCO was during this pandemic, with over 3,000 online debates were held in 160 countries uh, in the framework of the Resiliard initiatives, and uh, also in other sectors, you were quite active. Um, and uh, thank you also for laying down the uh, policy priorities in the short and in the long term. What's my thought always to uh, these discussions is we discuss very often with the ministers of culture and what I experience, my experience also in the European Parliament is you have to discuss with the ministers of economy and the ministers of finance too, because uh, uh, the cultural and creative sector, our cultural industries are a really relevant economical factor and uh, are also quite relevant uh, uh, when it comes to the financial sector. And that's the reason why I hope that also other uh, ministers, uh, the ministers of finance and economy will discover uh, their heart for culture in future. Thank you. So um, now we come to the uh, uh, interventions. Uh, first with uh, Snezhina Petrova, 
please, Mrs. Petrova, you have the floor for three minutes. Dear Chair, honorable members, dear participants, thank you for the invitation to Commissioner Gabriel. Unfortunately, she is not in a position to attend the event since she is in college. She has, however, asked me to represent her today, convey her message on her behalf, and more importantly, listen to your entire event. Let me first thank you once again on her behalf for the constant and strong support you and the entire European Parliament have given to the sector and our programs. In particular, Horizon Europe, Creative Europe, Erasmus Plus, European Solidarity Corps. Last week, the debate and vote in the European Parliament on our programs sent a strong message to the cultural and creative sectors. And now it is time to come back stronger together. This is also the message that Commissioner Gabriel conveyed during the ministerial that took place last week. As we know, it is essential that new member states take full advantage of the recovery and resilience facility to enable recovery from the negative impact of the COVID pandemic and to make the cultural and creative sectors more resilient, more resilient to future crises by addressing the structural challenges they face. The recovery and resilience plans are not quite final yet, and it is too early to disclose results, but I can already say that some member states did take this opportunity for culture. I'm sure we will have further opportunities to analyze and discuss the recovery and resilience plans as regards culture in details once they are all adopted and draw lessons from this. Last week's Council conclusions on the recovery of the sectors also invite member states to promote within the appropriate frameworks social protection for cultural and creative sectors professionals that take into account the characteristics of cultural and creative activities in close dialogue with the sectors and encourage the exploration of new ways and means of securing artists' income in full respect of subsidiarity, of course. The European Parliament has done very important work on these topics already, for example, in its resolution on Europe's cultural recovery, as well as different studies on the topic, as well as the draft report on the situation of artists and cultural recovery in the EU. We all agree that action is needed concerning the improvement of the working conditions of artists, as well as cultural and creative professionals in times of the pandemic more than ever. My services are working actively on this topic. We issued a We'll conduct a dialogue in June, the work of our Voices of Culture Structured Dialogue. And in September, we will launch an expert group with member states' representatives on the status and working conditions of parties with results expected next year. The most pressing way forward for culture is now, of course, above all about reopening cultural places. Many EU countries have started with actually reopening the cultural sectors. What is for the cultural and creative sectors? And there are many professionals to have a clear perspective and a step-by-step -step approach, enabling them within their specific settings and parameters to plan the organized resumption of their activities. This is where our communication coronavirus, a common path to Europe's safe reopening fits in. As you know, it was announced that we would develop guidelines for cultural and creative sectors in the field of music, audiovisual, performing arts, exhibition spaces, such as museums or gallery, libraries, and cultural heritage. Here, what will be important in our view is to base ourselves on existing measures that are being taken at local, regional, and national levels. For this, your discussion today and your input will be extremely valuable. Internal work has started already, liaising with all the services involved. As developments are happening across the EU member states, we need to move fast and come up with these guidelines before the summer officially kicks in. While we will do our way best to support the countries and the sectors, it is important to underline 
that high vaccination coverage of the population is the only sustainable approach for fully lifting measures and reopening the society, including cultural establishments. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Petrova. Also, a thank you to Maria Gabriel, even she could not be here in person, but for uh, uh, her is very engaged uh, work uh, for the cultural sector. Now I would pass the floor to Alexis Georgoulis, also for three minutes, please. Thank you, Sabina. Hello, everyone. As shown by the title of our common event, Coming Back Stronger, Ways Forward to for Culture, there is a great need to make use of the lessons that the pandemic taught us. The cultural pre-existing problems and inequities were inflated by COVID-19, highlighting the urgency to tackle the situation at a European level. Therefore, we need the European framework for working conditions in cultural and creative sectors. There are several issues that um, I know firsthand by my own experience as an actor, and I urge you to also focus on the precarious labor conditions of artists. We need to tackle the non-standard nature of artists' working conditions, financial instability, and the limited access to social security benefits. As all European citizens, cultural workers should get payment according to their work in real life as well as in the digital world. Rehazas, for example, should be included as regular working time for all relevant social and financial benefits in all member states. Additionally, any digital presentation of cultural content should lead to a fair and proportionate remuneration for the creators involved. Moreover, artists should have access to the same social security safety nets as all European citizens have, especially artists in performing arts. Their only professional equipment is their own physical body, meaning that if an actor, a musician, a dancer gets injured, they would not be able to walk at all, and very often unable to achieve high levels of performance ever again. Therefore, there should be a special health insurance policy for the, for the specific features of artists. A solid first step in order to provide a multidimensional, holistic and coherent policy instrument is working together to create a new resolution aiming at strengthening the sustainability of cultural and creative sectors. After all, this is what today's event is about, to bring us together. Let's not forget that culture is the catalyst to bridge our differences, to strengthen the dialogue among, and we, the members of the European Parliament, coming from different political groups, in the CAL committee should lead the example and unite forces to achieve a European framework for working conditions in cultural and creative sectors. Together we go further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexis. And now we pass over to Andrei Slavakov also for three minutes. Thank you. Благодаря, уважаема Сабине, надявам се преводачите да ме чуват добре най-после, че предишното... Well, thank you very much, Sabine, and I hope that everyone hears me loud and clear. We have had a few issues last time, but I have been deeply inspired by the fact that today interpreters are also on the Portuguese channel. Anyway, uh, I am very happy about the fact that this topic, this uh, event could be organized, and investments in uh, culture and creation are investments for the future but the EU has very few programs uh, in the end for culture when we talk about investments we should not forget that member states are the ones to define policies on culture I am convinced that the most important criteria on all projects should take into account the, the artistic content and uh, should not um, be intertwined with red tape uh, 
And I think that uh, national um, considerations shouldn't be sacrificed in favor of European uh, considerations. Member states have closed all the centers for culture. And as a consequence, today the debate is not to know if we need to close it or not. Today, we need to talk to artists and provide them concrete solutions so that they can survive to this crisis. Professionals wish to work, and this is why we need to uh, unite our efforts to to find solutions for professionals for they can continue working together. Unfortunately, we are unable to hear our colleague properly. President Macron wishes to give 300 euro to all European citizens so that they could well invest in cultural and artistic uh, initiatives uh, act and activities. I think this is a nice idea and Uh, this would be nice, especially if it could fund European platforms, because we should stop in funding uh, US platforms, and we need to provide uh, this kind of protection to European stakeholders, and I hope that other member states will follow up on France's initiative, and I hope to ma uh, support the uh, creative industry in Europe to bounce back. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much, vielen Dank. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, as we don't have questions in the chat until now, I will hand over to my colleague, Laurence Farin, who will guide you through the first panel session. And now, uh, Laurence, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup, cher Sabine. Thank you, dear Sabine. Good morning to all of you and good morning to the interpreters as well. I am Laurence Farang. I am MEP and uh, coordinator for cult within Renew Europe. Let me also say that I am deeply happy to see this event uh, is organized. Uh, this uh, is taking place this morning. We've been trying to organize it with all our colleagues here in the room for the last few weeks and as Sabine has said it, it has been done with uh, six political families and this shows our commitment vis-a-vis -vis culture and artists this is quite a logic um, uh, a co logic uh, step forward after what we voted one year ago in order to support culture in its recovery as you said earlier so one year has passed and our cult Committee for Education and Youth and Sports as well has been tackling this issue of uh, putting an end to lockdown to uh, this industry. It is challenging because the competences of the EU here are quite limited nowadays. And furthermore, we need to strike a balance between safety, health, health security and uh, helping Europe, uh, Europe's culture bouncing back after these difficult times. I think that today, together, we can agree on the fact that we need to learn from the experiences which have been carried throughout the world, but also within our member states in Europe in order to coordinate uh, the creation of a new, Euro a new uh, cultural life. We've had an event in Barcelona without any contamination and other tests in Luxembourg and Leipzig. And thanks to these tests in Paris, we will have a concert with 5,000 people. And building on all these experiences, we are able to pave a way forward. And as soon as clubs, uh, bars, restaurants, uh, and all cultural spaces will be open, we will need to ask ourselves how we'll be able to have uh, the distancing rules, masks and other safety nets uh, and make culture thrive because culture is also intertwined with 
uh, encounters and meeting new people. And this is why we invited a first panel uh, I would like to welcome and I will give five minutes to each of you. Please stick to these five minutes and then we'll have a, a, a wider exchange with the public and I think we have many people here and you'll be free to ask your questions in the chat. So first of all, let me warmly welcome Jordi Arulola, director of the Goya uh, Festival in Barcelona and who has also, also been in charge of the concert end of March. Afterwards, we will hear Coralie Beral, who is uh, venue manager of Forest National, uh, 8,000 uh, uh, seats and with also chair of the different arenas. And finally, I will give the floor to Mr. Sébastien Jessin, who is chair of uh, Les Forces Musicales, a trade union, and who is also chair of FEPS, uh, Living um, shows. Uh, thank you very much for being here and without further ado, let me give the floor to Jordi Herwelaf. You have five minutes, sir. Thank you very much. Monsieur Herrera, is he connected? Mr. Herrera, are you with us? Are you connected? Very good morning. Thank you, Laurence, and thank you to all of you. If you allow me, I would like to explain to you my experience in the past year and a half since the beginning of the COVID crisis. Since the month of Mar March last year, the cultural world was blamed to be possible spreaders of COVID because it's a um, united too many people together brought together too many people and without respecting social distancing from that moment i started contacting different public administrations and science scientists in terms of health we have a whole group of experts health experts in barcelona so i wanted to understand what the situation really was and the idea to develop this type of uh, tests like a music festival, which is like creating an ephemeral city for 30,000, 40 or 50,000 people following strict and technological protocols. And towards the month of May, after many exchanges with these scientific committees, I realized that this was not feasible because they had a high error margin, three or four percent of false negatives that could uh, increase the propagation of the virus greatly. So at the end of the summer last year, we proposed alternative models. We kept culture alive all throughout the year, offering shows. So while we offered um, guaranteed social distancing and limited quorum, but at least in this shape and form, we guaranteed the security of the people and we kept culture alive. We um, respected social distancing and there was no COVID infections during those uh, events. And in September, we, uh, we learned that there were new tests, antigenous tests. Well, as you know, these are not the best tool to identify who has the virus, but it is almost 100% safe to know who can potentially pass on the virus. So thanks to these tests, we could create what we call sanitary bubbles. So we tested everybody that could have access to the, to the show. And with a negative test, it could be guaranteed that no mm, contamination could arise. So we carry out this initiative. We told the administration, why don't we do some type of uh, test or rehearsals? The first one was in December in the Apollo room with 500 people and there was no contamination. The second one of them was uh, in March in the Palau San Jordi with 5,000 people. Just to make you understand it clearly, just imagine it is as if the administration um, asked us to uh, protect ourselves with some Gruyere cheese layers with holes, if you understand what I mean. 
One of these holes is social distancing. Another one is facial masks. Another one is ventilation. So what we suggested, thanks to the support of the scientists, was to eliminate one of these layers, social distancing, and replace it with the antigenous test. In this way, we kept security and safety, and the rehearsals showed that these are 100% safe. And today we have announced that on the next day, in 9th of July, the Cruja Festival will be able to take place in Barcelona without social distancing this summer. So this is a great piece of news for everybody, for the artists, producers, promoters, administrations, for the public at large. Culture and science have got together to guarantee security and to make sure that if new crises arise, we have a solution. We don't have to close all doors to culture. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I have directly a question for you. If you go a bit beyond, do you think that once the whole population will be vaccinated, we will be able to resume a completely normal cultural life as if nothing happened? Did you work on that already? Once vaccination will have reached a high level? Yes, well, there seems to be two options. One is that the vaccination is uh, fully efficient and everybody is vaccinated and then we can go back to a fully normal life. But option B is that the new strains, the new variants can really impact in our lives or that there might be yet another type of sanitary crisis. And we need to be prepared for this eventuality. So what we have done with this uh, rapid test was to find a solution an alternative to confinement, to lockdown. Now we are working with local administrations so that the, pharma the pharmacies can provide and they can be some type of notaries of our health state through this system. This is the only guarantee that we can have in face of a new crisis. This could be the only alternative to lockdown if vaccines are not going to solve everything. Perhaps in November we will realize that this hasn't really worked, but if there is another crisis, at least we have a well-functioning system that keeps culture alive. Thank you very much for your very important and interesting testimony. Now I would like to give the floor to Coralie Beral, who is the venue manager of a Forêt National venue in Brussels. Thank you very much, Lawrence. In English, um, so it's an honor uh, to represent the uh, Arena Resilience Alliance uh, here today. Um, it's a collaboration of major European arenas uh, behind one goal, and that is at the moment to recover from this pandemic, but most of all to remain resilient towards future threats. Since September, the Alliance organized several webinars and has lobbying in crescendo, to use music terms, towards the uh, European authorities to give a better understanding of what our industry stands for. For many decades, arenas and their ecosystems have been contributing in strict to sensu to cultural education of our communities, but also to the economy of each country, to the broader education and well-being of society. And yet, we became non-essential. We were shut down in a panic, put aside, and in 15 months, able to reopen. This without any scientific evidence. Even worse, we were ignored with the only perspective of reopening in the very last position. On the practical side, reopening the industry, our industry in many countries, based, was based on accumulation of measures that only our industry is faced with, so culture, will still be penalized as opposed to other types of industries like retail or restaurants or cinemas. We need to accumulate and test at the entrance and even test negatively. We still need to wear a mask. We still need to keep social distance, etc., etc. So the industry took this matter in, in their own hands. And indeed, like it was mentioned before, uh, many test events were organized in several countries to prove that our approach is uh, safe and sound, 
that it's a level of expertise in a very controlled environment. Many arenas in Europe financed themselves costly test events. Needless to say that the results were as expected. Uh, they were organized in a controlled environment and so even less dangerous than inviting one person into your living room. We need to build trust and confidence in what we stand for. Each arena is indeed an ecosystem of many professionals, and I'm not referring to the artists or promoter, I'm referring to crowd managers, safety and security experts, hygiene specialists active within this uh, industry. All the expertise and best practices that the ARA stands for, they were, they were needed in, in this pandemic. We had real experts ready to contribute and become part of the solution in any crisis situation. In many countries, these professionals have set up and are coordinating vaccination centers, as a matter of fact. So not to forget how we reinvented ourselves already since the terrorist threats of the, since the last five years. So going forward, it is essential that this underestimation and the vulnerability uh, that we have been faced with should not repeat itself, never again. Going forward, we should be seen as a reliable partner, not as a liability. We need to work on this image and put our professionalism in the spotlight instead of the artist. And the way to make our activities resilient and future-proof is key. So through our industry, through an artist, we must not forget that we can influence thousands of people to do the right thing, to have the right gesture. We play an important role in the education of a community and of a society, not only with regards to safety and security measures and mitigation, hygiene gestures, sustainability, and digitalization going forward. So finally, we are heavily depending of international artists touring across Europe, which at the moment is almost impossible to think, to think of as local governments have their final say uh, on the measures. As a result, these can be very different from one country to another in terms of quarantine. In some countries, some cities, there is no quarantine. Some have seven, 10, 14 days. Social distance can be one meter in one country, but 1.5 or two meter in another. Some have, uh, take the COVID pass very seriously. Others um, support the health check, whether it's a temperature check or uh, a PCR test. So it, it goes, uh, in all kinds of directions and tours take for us six months to a year to prepare. It's very complicated to engage and almost impossible uh, with no clear perspective. So touring shows are almost uninsurable in the current context. This is a real opportunity, we believe, to, to come to a uniform set of measures across Europe to enable artists to go on tour again. It is vital to give our industry the chance to sing along the same melody as it were across Europe. And it is essential, an essential right for our society. Needs to say the sector is not only financially drained, Justement, but after- excuse me, oui? if I can permit, I would like to ask you a okay. question on this subject. Well, actually, I had one question on this topic. We will reopen uh, one day or another. And do you worry that there will be too many uh, shows? Uh, all the artists will have the lockdown period. How do you react to that on that saturation? Um, so we are facing indeed a bottleneck into 2022 and 2023. It's the roaring 20s. However, we are facing a major brain drain and staff shortages because obviously the, the, the tours that were planned for 2020, 2021, they will come on uh, 2022-23 together with new uh, tours. And so, you know, the, the technical teams uh, at some point will have to choose which tour they are going to uh, to take on. So recruitment and, and investment in staff training will be necessary to ensure the level of, of quality we reached prior to the pandemic. It will take us several years to, uh, 
to get back to uh, to a decent um, a decent level. It is an issue, and and because of that, uh, some uh, artists their uh, of uh, of staff. So so yeah, it it is a it it is one of the major. Uh, concerns at the moment but you know the ARA remains available for supporting um, the European institution in working out future strategies to enforce uh, our industry uh, together uh, and that can be in terms of obviously merci, training merci and safety security merci beaucoup et c'est quoi we are working on that today thank you ever so much no, if you like, uh, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Sébastien Justin, director of the Force Musicale, for his testimony. Mr. Justin, you have the floor. Um, hello, Madame Faring. I thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. I do think that they are really valuable. We have covered a lot of issues already, so I won't repeat it all. And. Uh, would like to echo uh, what my previous colleagues said. The crisis led to a stoppage of our activities, and it was a serious shock for us all. There were economic impacts, they were really um, enormous, considerable, and the following speaker will also mention that, and uh, Jean-Noël Tron will mention uh, the, those impacts. And we have had also a societal problem. We have had a psychological, moral, political impacts. To get out of the crisis, it is key that we raise the awareness. My colleague said that we were considered as non-essential. And granted, it was an administrative term but that approach led to many damages and those damages were enormous in order to get out of the crisis it is of the utmost importance to have an, an awareness of that situation and during the discussion we were uh, um, asked about the positive evolutions the sector was able to keep on working in spite of all the constraints that were imposed upon it. Of course, uh, means are required to do so, and we will have to think about those means. But the uh, terrific mobilization of artists, of cultural professionals in or professional organizations in trade unions and at the national and European level was commendable. I'm also a member of the European uh, Federation that will also um, have the floor today. We have had a lot of exchanges, a lot of um, discussions to find solutions in order to address the crisis. In the previous um, uh, speech there was a comment about or a reaction to uh, the attacks terrorist attacks and all sector was able to adapt I would like to echo the, um, what was interesting during the period is that we were able to implement a real collaboration with the scientific uh, world community to me, that collaboration is extremely valuable. Indeed, it helps um, uh, have um, good scientists. We were faced with uh, political decisions that were not always based on scientific facts um, in order to have a contact, to have a direct uh, relationship with artists. Because I represent uh, performance artists, and in spite of all the exp experiments that have been carried out online, nothing can substitute the real life experience with artists. Hence, the, all the tests that you have mentioned and all the work we 
that if you identify the spread of the virus in our activities in order to take the adequate measures in order to keep on working while ensuring the uh, health and safety were extremely important we um, identify a risk in choirs and in instrument um, uh, performances, we work with all to adopt uh, measures, masks in order to avoid a uh, spread of the virus and the ventilation of places if, of the utmost importance in, of, in order to avoid the spread of the virus so that we should not restrict our activities, on the contrary, so that we can keep on working with artists or artists cannot work. we need to make sure that the public can come back in um, cultural venues experiments with different types of protocols will help us prove that we can work with tests for example previous uh, tests or measures in situ um, we know that it's extremely limited when adequate measures are adopted Therefore, we need to implement measures so that we can keep on working. It was said previously that with the new variants, there could be a new health crisis. Our goal today is to make sure that our activities are not stopped as there were previous uh, stages in uh, those in this period uh, first we were forced to completely stop our activities then we realized that we could keep on working for the future we need to work in conditions is of course extremely important and i'm happy to hear many colleagues saying that uh, artists can work uh, and uh, after the crisis we will realize that uh, uh, national solidarity was of of the utmost importance in france at least damages will be enormous sorry i'll have to, to ask you a question because the time is of the essence today i have a question on uh, another point a training of artists uh, would be artists uh, in times of crisis how can you do that very quickly um, in those times of crisis uh, the training of artists is complicated artists kept on training and we will need to give prospects to those uh, a new, newly trained artists. We will get out of the crisis, but the situation will be the following. We will have many on hold projects. And as my colleague said, the um, recovery will be slow. We won't resume a normal activity uh, quickly. So we need to give prospects to those new professionals. Thank you very much. Um, the diversity and complementarity of all your testimonies were very, very interesting. We have three minutes for a last question. Uh, does any of my colleagues connected in this call uh, wish to ask a question? No, it does not seem to be the case. So you were very, very accurate and detailed. We would like to listen to you for hours, but we need to open a new debate. And I would like to give the floor to Sally Mayin, that is name from the Greens group. We are colleagues in the cult committee. She will moderate the second panel. If you want to react to this event, do not hesitate to take the floor. And your questions are expected on Zoom chat or in the live cast. So thank you very much for your uh, first discussions. And Selima, I give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Lawrence. And thank you very much for all the changes. Thank you to the moderators and the teams, and thank you to Sabine as well. Thank you for this first part of the event. It was really enriching to listen to all of you, to all those creative and innovative initiatives that were created in order to facilitate the reopening of our cultural and show venues, live performance venues. I do not have to introduce myself anymore, as Lawrence did that for me. 
uh, maybe an extra comment. I'm a member of the AFET committee and of the Human Rights Committee. Why am I specifying that? Be because I am defending the idea of cultural diplomacy. I now have the honor of, open of opening the second panel. It is going to focus on what's next and the next steps for the cultural industry in Europe. We are reaching the end of the second wave of the pandemic, almost at least. And as the first panel explained, we now have tools in order to have a cultural activity in a safe manner. But how is going to look like the world of tomorrow? How can we help artists recover? How can we make sure that uh, artists and cultural professionals can work in a sustainable manner? And we are at a turning point uh, for recovery and reopening, of course, but also uh, during the conference on the future of Europe. And it is of the utmost importance. It was uh, started on the 9th of May. It is also a key opportunity to strengthen the Europe of culture. Nothing is impossible at first glance, or at least everything is possible. We have the opportunity to strengthen culture as a driver of European values. What are the different prospects and recommendations for that future? As for the first panel, we are lucky enough to have a very high level panelists uh, representing different uh, cultural sectors and academia as well. I would like to welcome Julia Pagel, Secretary General of the Network of European Museum Organization, Professor Sergei Inyatov, Rector of European Humanities University in Vilnius, Lithuania. Laura Holgate, CEO of the International Union of Cinemas, UNIC, and Jean-Noël Tron, Chair of the Board of the GESAC. Mr. Tron, I think, is not with us yet. He will be with us at uh, a quarter past 11. So no, if you like, I would like to give the floor to our different experts for five minutes. Please respect the time. Madam Pajel, you have the floor. Hello, and thank you for the invitation. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Um, I'm Julia Pagel. Thank you for the introduction, Secretary General of NEMO. Uh, we're also a member of Culture Action Europe and the European Heritage Alliance, just to say that we're not only the museums, but also speaking for a larger heritage sector. In the short time that I have, I would like to refer to three aspects specifically, the longer term impact of the lockdown for museums and their learnings from it, steps to make the museum more resilient to future crises, and two uh, concrete recommendations for decision makers. So st let's start with the assessment of the longer term impact for museums and their learnings from it. Learning number one, uh, museums are more flexible than we think, and probably that they have thought themselves. We've also offers that museums came up with in the first weeks of shutdown in April last year. There was a digital wave of offers, learning materials, videos, online games, social media challenges, all done without any additional resources, by shifting staff tasks and improvising. And now we have to think about how to keep that wave up. We need to level it up with investment in staff and infrastructure and strategic reviewing, because what we have seen is innovation at its best. And innovation can come through ruptures and unprecedented situations like the pandemic. But to make innovation a structural component of cultural organizations, we need serious and targeted support. Learning number two, a museum without visitors is lacking its main reason of existence because a museum is for people. And that has been reflected in all of our surveys when we ask museums what their biggest challenge and the most important topic of their future conversation was to bring back visitors to the museum. We've noticed that the local community has been and will be playing a bigger role, which means that the engagement will be more vertical instead of horizontal with visitors, maybe fewer exhibitions, but more forms of engaging with it, building on relationships that make people come back to the museum. And the digital extension was a good tool to help connect to visitors online during the shutdown. And surely there's lots of potential, especially in the learning and the Creative area to be explored. 
But I would argue that before we move to these amazing, amazing projects, we really need to do some groundwork, understand our digital users and the non-users to create the best possible access for everybody. Learning number three, museums are more than just cultural spaces. There are places of encounter. They provide public spaces in growingly commodified cities and infrastructurally weak regions. They've shown during Corona how much they can be actual places of learning of art by becoming a school, by being a vaccination center, by handing out gloves and, and masks. A colleague of mine, director of a mid-sized German museum, said to me when I was mentioning this meeting today that she has one message that she would like to share. She said, policymakers could ask way more from museums for different agendas if they acknowledged how museums are already impacting on society in education for cohesion and democracy. And I would like to add that this message does not only go to policymakers, it also goes to museums themselves because they need to be aware of their social importance and potential in order to fully tap it. So how can we make museums more resilient to future crises? Learn from Corona is that it acted as an issue. From Korea, it also triggered all kinds of incredible innovation and creativity. The question of how to become future proof, be it for crises, for a changing society, technological development, has been debated for long already. And we've been discussing about transformation deficits in the sector and a lack of adaptation to social change for quite some time. So, the basic ingredients to an agile, open, transformative organization, more autonomy on organizational and individual level, innovation focus, proactivity and daring to experiment, and sometimes to fail. And now hardly any of those ingredients are part of the public funding logic. On the contrary, we've seen large amounts of money going to digitization projects for a great virtual tour and museum. And don't get me wrong, I love that, but hardly any support for infrastructure building or maintenance services just as um, training, skills, development, funding to develop a comprehensive digital strategy are hardly supported. To make a long story short, museums need support for uh, less support for project and output driven one of initiatives. They need support for long term sustainable organizational adaptation and change. And that brings me to the two recommendations and I would like to cite Nemo COVID-19 and museum survey. Recommendation number one, next to the continued support for museums to ensure the maintenance of quality core activities and investment in the ongoing adaptation and development of museums. Nemo recommends investing in and developing museum skills and knowledge to access and open new sources of funding outside state support through dedicated programs and initiatives. And recommendation number two is for the digital development we recommend a strong focus on the basics, the development of digital skills and infrastructures of museums, including the development of sound metrics, frameworks, and methods to track digital activities and success. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, madame. Thank uh, you ever so much. Let me now give the floor to Professor I mean, uh, Sergei, over to you. Uh, when I was preparing for my short message discussing with Mr. Slobak, we decided to speak Bulgarian, but because something unprecedented happened three years, uh, three days ago, I'll start in English and if you want, I, I could switch on Bulgarian. Three days ago, um, unprecedented Air Piracy Act was organized by the Russian authorities in order to arrest uh, Roman Patraskevich and a young lady was uh, with him, Sofia Sapeva. Why I am starting with this? Because as a rector of European Humanities University, I just want to inform you that Sofia Sapega, who was arrested after this brutal, unprecedented uh, act of air piracy, is my student. She is a student of my university, and she's facing uh, more than two months to be detained for doing nothing. 
only because uh, she supported uh, uh, this uh, very, very, very famous uh, in, in Belarus, uh, and uh, what what happens what happens since uh, the elections in Belarus uh, from August last year? More than 50, 50 graduates and students from my university are arrested. They were detained. Some of them uh, were recognized as political prisoners there in Belarus, facing uh, sentences from 12 years. A young girl, 22 years old, expected, uh, waited, waited this 12 years in prison. That is, that is why I, my appeal is to support this university. European Humanities University is Belarusian University in exile, based in uh, Vilnius, supported by European Commission, of course, uh, Lithuanian uh, government. But now the situation, the situation is out of control because I have, as I said, more than 50 young, young persons, graduates and students from my university who were arrested there. And the last one is uh, Sofia Sapel. Now I continue, uh, I, I come back to our cultural problems. Uh, okay, conti I'll continue in English. My, uh, my understanding of culture is that culture is more older, more ancient, the history of culture than the history of states, especially of national states. That is why we are here in this room because uh, we are here be because of sharing common culture of values, starting from the oldest European civilization, the so-called Danube civilization, more than 7,000 year, years ago, till now. We, in this room, we are sharing one and the same culture of values. And this is very, very important. The second, uh, the second statement is that culture and education are one and the same. Uh, starting from ancient Elada or ancient Greece, this is paideia, which means education and culture in one and the same way. Two sides of one and the same uh, coin. And because I was instructed to speak about the future, what will happen with our culture after this pandemic situation, uh, the first, the first uh, what comes to my mind is that the health crisis opened a new gap in producing and accepting cultural product. COVID-19 crisis has increased social inequality, which will lead to the dropping out more cultural makers, authors, and their public as well. More than a year, we are not stopping to repeat the mantra, digital, digitalization, digital transformation, and so on. And it's true. Thanks to technologies, uh, it's very possible. It's very possible now to communicate, uh, to see different stars from the fields of culture from different parts of the globe. But culture, especially literature, theater, music, cinema in our days, which derives from all this, the culture, this culture of phenomena was born from ancient mysteries and still has the element of dedication. We, sh we, are, we should be introduced to, to this uh, event. For example, we are in the, this mag magical room of theater, of opera, of, uh, of the cinema. It means that the efforts of actors and public are equal. They are equal because the, percent, the, 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 the perception, for example, of uh, uh, theater, when we, we are there in this magical room, differs from viewing theater on our monitors, for example. The, 
digitalization makes us more viewers than players. The human beings are social creatures, as you know, and the social element tended to disappear during this pandemic here. According even to my experience, because I'm lecturing more than six, eight hours uh, per week using Zoom or Moodle, diff different, uh, different instruments. And uh, what I see, what I see is that this social element disappears. For example, the, the language of my using now uh, this uh, English uh, words uh, uh, communicated with you. You don't see, for example, my belt, my shoes, everything. It was uh, mentioned about the big, big platforms like Netflix, for example. They are very useful, very friendly, but uh, I believe that this monopolism leads us to unification of culture. And uh, that is why there is a need of balance, because if we have the unification of culture, this is not very good for us because the culture, uh, culture is a product of, um, of dif different uh, languages, of uh, uh, flexibility, of different of movement of ideas coming from different parts of, uh, of in, in our case, from uh, Europe. I belong to right-wing political views. Excuse me, Professor. Désolé. Est-ce que? Excuse me, Mr. Professor. Let me give you one more minute, maybe, to try to reach your conclusion. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we need to first to increase the percentage of states' budgets on nation levels about sectors of culture and uh, and education. Second, there is a need of tax reliefs for persons and families case of using cultural and educational products, theater, cinema, buying books, museums, opera, uh, etc. There is a need of tax reliefs of using educational services which are not supported by the government, which we don't belong to public sector, for example, private schools, private. Uh, for novelists, there, uh, there is a need to create opportunities uh, for finance support, stipends or scholarships for a period of two years in order to write a book on their proper languages. I think that I have this, I had this five minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. And you are right, uh, Professor. Authoritarian states tend to attack culture because culture emancipates its source of freedom and liberties and uh, intertwined with humanistic values. Let me now give the floor to Laura Hulgat. Madam, over to you. You have five minutes as well. I I'll try to stick, I'll stick to them. Don't worry. Don't worry at all. I will stick to them. Speak about what, of course, I know best. And for me, it's just a quick reminder that 2019 was a record year for cinemas in Europe. 8.8 .8 billion at the box office, 1.34 um, million admissions, and 2020 starting even better. So when COVID happened, you can imagine that it hurt even more. Uh, and shutting down a cinema, like all the cultural venues, it's not only switching off the lights. You have to take care of your staff, you still have to pay your rent, uh, you have to take care of your stock if you're selling food as well, what are you going to do with that? And you have to make sure that you keep up you know, all your infrastructure and material. You also have to keep in touch with your audience and make sure that you don't lose this special link that you have as a social place. Um, and of course, in this first close down, then you had to get ready and prepare reopening guidelines together with, with government. And we had a first reopening in May, June in Europe, uh, in a number of countries. But as you know, we also had a second shutdown, uh, which was, dare I say, even more painful than the first one. Um, what was important for us is, is of course, the safety. Uh, that was mentioned by a couple of you know, colleagues uh, earlier in this conference, that there was no one case of COVID traced back to a cinema. So again, showing that this was a safe place. 
And we were really encouraged by looking at all the surveys carried in a number of countries that people wanted to come back to the cinema. Uh, in France, it was 94% of people wanted to come back when the cinema reopened. We had similar figures in the UK. Um, and we are now happy to reopen gradually in Europe. We now have 67% of the market open with France, the UK and Poland having reopened more, more recently. Um, just to give you a couple of figures, um, because I know I've heard a lot during you know, lockdown, oh, but you know, people watch a lot of stuff online. Yes, it was the lockdown. They didn't have any choice. They couldn't go out anywhere. Uh, but as soon as cinemas reopened in a number of countries, we saw that people were coming back. In the UK, we had more than 1 million admissions over the weekend. Keep in mind, we have a 50% capacity. In France, uh, it's going to be an even better week than in 2019 or 2018. More people coming to the cinema with a 35% 35, 35 capacity and a curfew. So just to show how keen people are to come back. Um, we're also lucky to have a lot of films to show right now as we reopen. We have films for all audiences. Um, I've heard someone telling me it's going to be, you know, can We could take time. It is going to take time. We lost more than 70% uh, in the box office last year. Restrictions are going to be there for, you know, a few months at least. So, you know, we, it's going to evolve in time depending on where you are. So you have rent to pay. You have to train your staff. You have increased operational um, cost. I think I would like to recall that cinemas are key, you know, culturally, socially and economically. We're not only social hubs where we bring people together. We're also essential for the economics of the film value chain. Um, you know, this is where for, you know, 61% of the box office of independent distributors is made. It's at the cinema. Uh, we also, we pay taxes, we employ thousands of people. So I think it's important to recall that. Um, you know, we also need to, um, I think, be very commercial and being small cinemas. We also need all type of content. And for that, we need, of course, to support the European market production and distribution because they are essential. Um, so I think, you know, for us, it's like, I hear a lot of people, you know, coming out of the COVID telling us, oh, but cinemas, you know, will be dead, basically. Uh, you know, people are, you know, two years of watching stuff online. They won't want to go out anymore. I think what we see today with people can't wait to go out. People can't wait to enjoy, you know, things together, experience things as they should be. And I think how we can, you know, support this, coming from the audiovisual sector, for me, there's a couple of things. We talked about support, financial support. And that, of course, is essential. Help us, you know, with our infrastructure. Help us to train, you know, our staff and make sure that, you know, we are able to go through that period and thrive. Um, but also help us from a policy perspective. We're working on the Media Audiovisual Action Plan, for example. So make sure to recognize the role of cinemas. And again, not only as social hubs, but as part of the value chain. Make the best use of Creative Europe. Uh, it's great to encourage member states to spend money on culture, but if it's only an encouragement, a lot because culture will not be seen as a priority. So I think we need to be stronger on this. Help us to fight piracy. Help us on data transparency to help us compete with big platform. Um, and again, something mentioned in the map, you know, vertical integration is happening big time. And we need to make sure that big players are not going to stop the European, you know, film value chain, so cinemas, both for production and distribution, um, to, to thrive and to bring what's best to European audiences. So as a conclusion, I think um, for me, it's about the future for audiences and films. It's, it's, not, it's not going to be only online. Yes, online is part of the equation. But for me, it's also first and foremost at the cinema. Thank you. Merci, Madame Ulgat. Thank you very much, Madame Ulgat. Uh, Mr. Jean-Noël Tron, over to you. I think you, you arrived, right? Yes, in, yes, indeed, I'm here. Uh, 
Happy to see you here after our exchanges. Thank you, Madame MEP. Thank you to you and to MEP Laurence Farang and Sabine uh, Verheyen who are organizing this event. The, it's a pivotal moment for our continent and also for our industries of culture and creation, which represent a bit of a 7 million employments uh, within the EU and which more represent almost 600 billion euro. But when you think about the European art de vivre, as the, our US counterparts say, well, if you take into account tourism, heritage, luxury, design, well, we can say that more or less 10% of the GDP of our European Union is carried out uh, from, by JESAC, which I chair. And some 20 Europeans which are devastated by this crisis, and Sajem, which I lead, has received 30% of income, and we don't receive any subventions from uh, France, and we have given uh, support to over thousands of uh, workers in our industry. If you have a look at our jazz well, you can see over 200 billion euro uh, of value have been destroyed in 2020 and maybe even more in 2021 because uh, the industry is going on and one to two million employments are threatened today in the EU. And if we take into account tourism, health, hotels, restoration, well, we are talking about employments which cannot be delocalized, who will get a set culture cannot de be delocalized you not go you cannot go to a theater in shanghai if you live in vilnius and furthermore beyond uh, people who are employed to produce movies well there are other people who work for festivals for dance for music for video games and we do many tiny things i won't dig into details because we have not that much time ahead but i would like to focus on four main ideas first of all we need the eu it is paramount and we need our european parliament and i would like to thank from the bottom of my heart the meps thanks to wit the resolution from september 2020 on the recovery of culture in europe uh, allowed to send a strong message to the EC and let me tell you end of January I was leading a delegation of artists and we met seven European commissioners and Dobr Dombrovsky and then uh, Maria Gabriela and we also met other commissioners and Commissioner Gentinoli uh, ensured that he would support us and his service is now working with us on the monitoring of re res resilience and recovery plan. Uh, the resilience and recovery facility because it has not been acted yet and less than one percent of our um, of um, European citizens uh, Engl uh, have English as a mother tongue, so this is a topic we should tackle, but uh, even though it's not for today. So we need the EU, and hats off to the European Parliament, we ha which has shown what had to be done. Second thing, as it has been, Professor Ignatov, Europe is not a technical system based on values, uh, laws and democracy. Uh, law and uh, democracy are also there in New Zealand, but also in North Korea. Uh, Europe is a civiliza civilization which is thousands of years old. Our roots are bringing us together, and your di all diversity is making us strong. I have waited a little for Europe, and I have been struck many times over and over again by the fact that many uh, European citizens feel European as soon as they leave the EU. And today we need dialogues to talk about the future of EU civilization, and we need to bear in mind that, that uh, Europe, uh, that Europe civilization is 
uh, stronger and more important than uh, Belarus, Putin or uh, China and that we also have something very positive vis-a-vis -vis the US because you and mm, mm, which fears what comes from a state or states and in this context I would like to recall that today we need Europe ever more than ever before because we've seen that uh, member states have had a uh, have tried to put an end to lockdown in a quite a chaotic way and I would like to thank MEPs who support us, supported us, Commissioner Breton uh, reassured us and normality, going back to normality, is not for tomorrow and distribution of uh, goods will uh, continue for, uh, to suffer from this situation until uh, next year or even afterwards. And finally, let me say that the resilience and recovery plan should have at least 2% for creative industry. This is a drop of water when we see what our industry represents. We demanded this, we talk about 15 billion euro, but this is nothing when we talk about seven, uh, a global envelope of 700 billion euro. euro. And today there is no warranty whatsoever. Plants are being built, but they l forget that it's thanks to, uh, to culture that we will be able to bounce back. Second opportunity we have today, the Conference on Future of Europe, which has has been kicked off. I took part, as many of you, in a round table on May the 9th for the uh, for for Europe and I think it is right to try to make of this initiative something to mobilize Europe's people and um, we need to make sure that our common house, the European Parliament, is at the forefront uh, of this. If it's not the case, then I am afraid that the Conference on the Future of Europe uh, will be um, uh, far away from European citizens. Finally, we'll have the French presidency starting uh, as of January the 1st, 2022, and this can be a chance to work together on culture and to defend your stakes or stakes together. Thank you ever so much for your attention. Merci, Monsieur Tron. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Tron. Thank you very much, Mr. Tron. Just one question which is quite important. Let me raise it. Louisa Lacala, who talks about uh, plans uh, for people who work in cultural activities. This question is to the Commission, who, which is listening to us, and so this question is addressed to the Commission. It is in the chat. The European Parliament has worked a lot on this issue. We are doing a follow-up to um, facilitate things. So here, a question to the Commission in the chat, then a question to bounce back on what you have said, Mr. Tron. The Conference on the Future of Europe, I've said it earlier, it's, a, it, it's crucial to reinforce the role of culture. But if you had the power to change everything, if you had a magic wand, how would you imagine uh, Europe of culture? Dear MEP, is this question to me? Yes, why not? I know you have some ideas, some leads, but it's a question to all three of you. Well, can I start, dear colleagues? The co panelist yes, yes. Well, I won't be long, but as, as you shall know, I published a book in 2019. Uh, and if we were to start, start with culture, uh, pleading in favor of, of Europe and sovereignty, when Europe was given powers on uh, culture during the elaboration of the Treaty of Maastricht, it was a bit too late. The double integration and expand, expanding process made the, U the Union difficult to manage in a quick and efficient way. And the crisis which followed, uh, first with the French rejecting the treaties in 2004, and then the financial crisis in Greece, and then Brexit, and nowadays COVID, have made us used in a dangerous way uh, of the fact that we just have to make do with that. And uh, please read After Europe from Ivan Krasnev, 
which recalls that our Easter, Easter, Eastern partners have witnessed a world system crumbling down in only two years' time, that nothing I is eternal, even the EU. So my answer shall be very easy and very to the point, dear MEP. It's not a uh, European policy we need, as I say it in my book, uh, the budget is 0.001%, 1,000. And the study from France Creative has shown that uh, culture is 1% of GDP. So this competence should remain national and it should not be at the level of the EU. And yes, some hundreds of millions mobilized by the EU is useful, but it's less than uh, what a big German lander could spend, for example, in culture. So today we need to, f need to face this reality and youngsters today are less European than middle-aged Europeans. And then Erasmus is a marvelous program, but it actually only touches less than 2% of European um, students and less than 1% of uh, European youngsters and uh, so it means we need we would have to carry out many efforts to expand Erasmus and so uh, or uh, culture should remain national or we should have 50 billion e billions a year then we should avoid that during the nef next referendum we would have an Italy exit or a Frexit and today we know that this could happen nothing is impossible so I've made 10 Ten proposed mention one. What's the major sign of uh, uh, de denial? Denial of our European identity. Well, uh, uh, notes, European notes, because actually these notes uh, show windows and doors, and uh, notes had not to be atta attached to any culture, and this is the. And notes are used by all 300 million citizens uh, every day because citizens don't go in an Aryan um, space shuttle every day. Not all citizens um, go on Erasmus, not all citizens uh, travel on an Airbus, but all citizens use notes. And as a consequence, an, a proposal which has been made public in France as well, let's have a European referendum uh, as pos as made possible by the European Treaty so that citizens would vote and so that European citizens would choose people from culture, politics, science which would be on our European notes. And finally, one example. M millions, tens of millions of tourists want to come to Europe. And Tiberlands, Timmermans and um, and uh, two Europeans who invented the World Wide Web. Mm, allowed to create innovation and uh, I'm ready to bet that if we were to make a poll within the 700, 750 MEPs in mm, that very few of them would know that uh, Europeans created the World Wide Web, even though it was uh, w in the U.S. that they did so and that they invented the IPs. Thank you ever so much. Anyone else? Si je peux juste, no. sorry, français anglais. Mais si je peux juste ajouter un point, je pense que pour moi, even if it is just a symbol, we should remind that culture is essential. It is of the utmost importance because for months we have been told that we were non-essential in uh, society's life and uh, it was really harsh for us, uh, for all structures as cultural venues. It was also uh, terrible for citizens to hear that culture was non-essential and we should make sure that culture is the, uh, priority when we talk about culture uh, be it as uh, through its uh, cultural or social dimension culture is key to gather people and of course a culture has a clear economic weight in europe thank you very much 
I do share this and I do share also the important point of creating a an a knowish a ownership sense in Europe through banknotes, for example, and through other proposals that I could find in your book, Mr. Tron. I have a last question. The cultural sector of tomorrow in Europe, how could we avoid intensify inequalities between public and private stakeholders and also within um, um, rich and uh, more vulnerable regions? Uh, some. Uh, um, um, some ideas have been given, but uh, would one of you like to come back on this issue? No, no one? Uh, I can, uh, of course, but just very quickly. What struck me was the uh, collective surprise of the uh, collect of the cultural stakeholders when we made public in 2015 the first study on the economic clout of culture. It was a big surprise. French uh, discovered, as usual, that in other European countries we invest massively for culture. There is no French exception when it comes to that issue. And to answer, uh, the second big surprise is that the complementarity of the public and private economic models in culture. And it has a lot of modernity. And I do think about European youth uh, that is deeply committed to social and solidarity issues. Let me give you the example of uh, my career. I was the leader of Orange, uh, the leader of a, a big um, subsidiary of Canal Plus. I was also advisor of the French Minister for Culture. I am familiar with the private and public spheres. A company such as mine, SASEM or GESAC, is a cooperative. But the others' companies are uh, big uh, private actors that can guarantee the independence of the stakeholders and ensure their income levels. And we saw and during the crisis uh, that uh, companies uh, such as Zaix in Poland and uh, other companies in Italy, Germany and Spain help save um, creators who did not receive any uh, penny from the public purse. In all the economic sectors in Europe, our cultural is uh, should uh, work together. And with your assistance, um, ladies and gentlemen, the MEPs, we should make sure that European citizens and decision makers at the European Commission understand that point. Thank you very much. Thank Can you I very maybe much. add one more aspect to it? Yeah, thank you. I, I, that was what I was going to offer to you. Go that's ahead. wonderful. Thank you. Maybe, I mean, 80% of the museums in Europe are to agree, a degree publicly funded, so I cannot so much speak about the inequalities here, but what I would like to repeat, though, is that we have to rethink the logic of public cultural funding. I think there is still a prevailing thinking in silos that reflect sectoral and language and country divisions, even though cross-sector and cross-boundary collaboration is really crucial. And culture exists in an increasingly global context, but funding logics still have a local mindset. And this is where we really need to tailor funding programs to the cultural sector's needs and allowing the courage to experiment and to fail and to make it more attractive for a third slash private parties to invest and to generate new revenue sources. Merci beaucoup. J'ai trois minutes. Si Thank you very much. We still do have three minutes if some speakers from the previous panel want to bounce back on the different questions. I cannot see everyone on my screen. So do we have any expression of interest? No? Okay. So I would like to thank all the panelists uh, from the previous panel, but also from this panel. I do thank you all. Thank you very much for informing us. And thank you as well for being so direct with uh, clear proposals that we will be able to use at the European Parliament in order to ensure the implementation of the recovery plan by the Commission. Now, I would like to give the floor to my colleagues, Fred Matic and Tomas Frankowski, for the uh, concluding remarks. 
but please stay with us up until the end of the event and to have the performance of the music band Laura Crow and him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Salima. Do you hear me? Dear colleagues, dear representatives of the cultural and the creative sector, let me first thank you for all your contribution today, as well as the interesting discussions we heard. We thank you for making one thing very clear. There, is, there are no risks related to attending cultural events live, even live events. This is excellent news that need to be shared and heard by everyone to make sure we finally open up the sectors again and let culture and creativity back into our lives. But of total or semic closure, the cultural rape is not the same. After listening to you, but also after all the consultations we had with different stakeholders in the sector, we can see that we are at the crossroads where we have the opportunity to reshape the practices in the sector for the more fair, just, equal and inclusive cultural and artistic future, starting from the key aspects for us, which is the workers' right aspect. We have for e Frank, which will allow all those working in the sector to have access to social security protection and fair work condition. We can't have a situation that people who produce culture and arts across the EU and thus shape our identity, build a European society and enable social progress are left unprotected and marginalized in their rights. With a strong focus on protection of work rights, one of the come to life also the need for a bottom approach for all interventions coming from our level and the member state level, the process process of creating the way forward for culture must come in cooperation and as signal, signaled by those who are namely part of this sector. As we all know, the creation of a better and stronger way forward will not be possible without ensuring sufficient advocacy for the earmarking of 2% from the recovery mechanism will continue, while we also have to find ways to strongly advocate and recommend the increase in long-term public invest for culture and art, as well as try and remove all obstacles that interfere with the sector's possibility to apply for funds, namely simplifying, simplifying the procedures in these applications and promote an increase in consequences and consequences we are facing today, and we will will continue to face has to be a lesson learned for the all future endeavors. Culture and art have to be prioritized and this needs to be a push, push for us to, together with all you build the resilience of the sector while fully and unap unapologetically protecting the independence of culture, culture and art. This is something we can continue to work also on the report of the status of the artists and culture recovery in the European Parliament. I'm open to hearing your suggestions and input as one of the reporters, to, so feel free to contact me. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleague Thomas Frankowski. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, on behalf of all political groups, I would like to warmly thank all the speakers for their contributions and recommendations. Big thanks also goes to my colleagues for making this conference happen. It is very timely and needed. As an MEP, I should admit that this is quite an exceptional situation when all the political groups are in complete agreement to take joint action on an issue. This shows that we are all very worried about the situation in the cultural and creative sectors and that we are all united for culture. I am proud that we are able to work together for all well-being of European culture and artists. As Mr. Matic rightly said, we have several tools in the European Parliament to address this situation, such as a report of the status of artists, a resolution on cultural recovery, and uh, the new Creative Euro program, just on a few. 
I hope that our work will help uh, with re the recovery of the sector by putting pressure on member states to prioritize culture in their national policies and national recovery plans. I would also like to highlight that a key achievement of today's conference is the joint declaration by six political groups, Strong Comeback for Culture, which will be published today. But now, without further delay, I would like to welcome our special guests, Laura Crow and him, young Belgian artists who are here with us today. Let me just say a few words about you. Uh, Laura Crow and him have had a great success on the cover of System of It Down with 1 million views to date on YouTube. And then in 2019, they released their first self-titled album, Laura Crow and Him, highlighted by the popularity of the track An Equilibre. Last summer, they had the hit tracks, I Don't Want Your Loving, and now La Jungle which evokes the reflection of the outside world and the pandemic. So Laura and Eric, before we listen to your live performance, which I think everyone is impatient for, uh, I have two questions which you could perhaps answer briefly. How has the pandemic affected your life uh, as an artist? And how do you see your future and work once we get back to normal? First of all, hi everyone, bonjour à tous. So uh, we are super happy to be here with you uh, for this event. It was really great. Thank you to all speakers. It was really, really interesting to hear about what you had to say about the situation. Um, for us, of course, as for many people, I guess many artists, it was really difficult at the beginning because as you just said, we released our debut album a year and a half ago. So just at the start of the pandemic, so it was really frustrating for us because we, we are independent and emerging artists and we are developing everything by ourselves. We had radio promotion planned, we were about to tour and everything was just stopped just like that. And so it was so frustrating. But um, we, we kept on cr being creative because this is our, the, the source of our motivation and it was really hard also because we are a duo and we are working together all the time. And so being apart from each other for so long was hard, but we started working from our respective homes and it worked quite well in the end because we, we wrote our, um, our last singles um, apart. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So uh, in the future, uh, we, we plan, of course, to, to play because uh, concerts are the key to uh, developing emerging artists. And uh, we, of course, we, we must have the creativity to, to find new source of diffusion. And the uh, internet has offered these with uh, all the platforms, but it's not... Uh, it's not uh, something very fair for emerging artists. So. Yes, because we were, we really think that the key um, to move forward is to reopen the cultural sector, of course, and having venues and festivals reopen again, because social media is, is wonderful to, to be connected to each other. But it's not, it's not what people want in the end. I mean, a, um, a live show is about sharing a moment all together and it cannot happen. The magic cannot happen through a screen. So um, it is really important that everything goes back to, to normal. And I mean, we are, we are passionate people, so we will always keep on creating new content and this is what we're living for. But, um, Honestly, I think that solutions have to be uh, sought after because uh, right now it's really difficult for um, emerging artists because as you can imagine, we, we don't get the chance to, to play live gigs anymore. And as you might say, as you might know, sorry, um, all digital platforms are not really retributing uh, artists very well. So it's kind of complicated, uh, financially speaking, of course. So uh, solution uh, 
um, had to be also found that uh, in that area. Thank you very much for this testimony and for sharing your experience with us today. No problem. And now <laughs> let's listen to all of the live performance of Laura and Crow and him at the stage and all our attention is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The first song we are about to play is our latest single, uh, which is in French. Uh, it's called La Jungle. And the situation we are living right now, we are <laughs> describing um, the, the world we are living in as a dangerous jungle full of... Uh, danger. Uh, full of danger, <laughs> but also a uh, appealing jungle. Okay. So. So much. <laughs> it's so nice to have a, a yeah it's nice to have an uh, audience <laughs> even though it's through a screen but right now <laughs> it's already nice uh, bravo merci merci beaucoup bravo <laughs> bravo c'est émouvant de vous entendre c'est vrai que c'est vrai que c'est la jungle pour la jeune génération particulière congratulations it was deeply moving and it's true it's the jungle for the young generations and if you are curious, we have made a video clip and dealing with that topic uh, through the Belgian lens because we lived that experience in Belgium and all video clip is available on YouTube. Do not hesitate to leave a comment. And we are using uh, YouTube uh, because we do not have a European platform yet. Uh, that is our, um, our, the single we released last summer, which is called I Don't Want You Loving. I don't want you loving. This is how I feel, though it's quite confusing. You're cute as fuck, but scary too. I don't know 
We're hoping the sound is, is great because <laughs> this is very rude. And we have the church right and here. We have the, the bells church, are ringing. The, bell, the bells are ringing. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry for this. Um, next song is uh, one taken from our debut album, and it is called. <laughs> Tes clés dans la porte quand tu rentres, quand tu sors, amour. Y a tout qui nous oppose, comme tes mains qui se posent sur mes hanches quand je dors, amour. Amour, ce qui ne tue pas nous rend fort, nos yeux se ferment encore et encore. On marche sur un fil en équilibre si fragile. Ne se déchaîne, on ne pense jamais qu'à nous-mêmes. Le bout des coups pas qu'on se donne nos ressources. Oh, no, I don't love you anymore. But maybe I won't go. I promise better fall and swallow, can we go? No, I don't care anymore. I'm just numb, you know. It's fine when you're lying hollow, can we go? Oh, c'est moi, mais on se persuade à tous les jours qu'on y croit. On joue encore jusqu'au jour où tout s'arrête. Jusqu'au jour où tout s'arrête. Et à tout ce que je garde pour moi, ces choses que je te dis pas, de peur que ça gâche un reste d'amour. Que ce soit facile, tout faire pour être tranquille, tenir en équilibre, mais toujours être libre d'amour. Oh, no, I don't love you anymore, but baby, I won't go. I'm 
promise that a four hours hollow can we go No, I don't care anymore I'm just numb, you know It's fine when you're lying How long can we go? Ooh, c'est marrant Mais on se perce à tous les jours qu'on y prend Bonjour encore Puis un beau jour <laughs> Congratulations, and we are looking forward to see your whole. A cover. A cover. A of, shiny one. A shiny one. A cover of Madonna, and this one's called "Don't Tell Me." Merci à tous. Thank you all okay. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I need to Merci say beaucoup. that my that assistant Kasia proposed uh, Laura Grove and him, and it seems uh, she has an excellent music taste. Uh, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> We feel really, really blessed. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so I would like to say thank you. Thank you for the wonderful music. I think that was the highlight of the event, but also thank you to all our participants. I think we got a very important input for our further discussions uh, for the next uh, uh, weeks and months of recovery. And uh, we will uh, take your uh, comments and your input on board when discussing the further actions we have to take from European side 
but also when we discuss with our national politicians and national responsible persons, uh, not just the ministers for culture, but also the ministers for economy and, and finance. Uh, I think that's very important that we really see culture as a systematic, a systemic uh, 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 range of, 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 of activities, uh, like uh, uh, the, the health sector too, because it's really uh, also important for mental health, for us as human beings as such, for our identity as human beings. And as it was said at the beginning, culture is older than all economies and all these structures because culture lies in the nature of human beings. So thanks a lot to all of you. Thanks a lot to those who organized uh, uh, this discussion. Thanks to the interpreters, to the technicians who made it possible that we could meet. Thank you to all of them who were not on the Zoom meeting, but on Facebook with us uh, streaming the event. And I hope that we reached out to many, many people and uh, gave a signal that we are, uh, that in our work, uh, culture is in the center, is in the heart uh, of our work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.